Well, thank you so much. So I should really say that um, I'm the conduit of knowledge here. This work was really done by Dorit Trudler, a postdoc in the lab, and her group. They're sitting there. They'll yell at me if I get it wrong, I'm sure. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, human iPS-derived microglial models of neurodegenerative disease. And this is kind of a new um, facet of our lab, and it's the first time I've actually given an outside talk on it. So I, I'd love to hear your, uh, your input on it. Um, so with all due deference to my hematopoietic stem cell colleagues in the first row, Kat, thank you for inviting me. I hope you'll continue after I say this to talk to me. Um, human brain microglia, not my data, are not hematopoietic stem cell lineage. So this had been debated for years, and now it's absolutely conclusive. They come from the yolk sac. They're different, and I'm going to show you a lot of RNA-seq data to show they're different, and that human is quite different than mouse which raises all kinds of issues about mouse models of neurodegenerative disease, okay? So many groups have now shown this was a beautiful uh, review by, by Beth Stevens in Nature Medicine a year and a half ago. So they're derived from the yolk sac. They have normal functions, as you see here. They're involved in uh, programmed cell death and phagocytosis. They can take up uh, abnormally folded, mis misfolded proteins and Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease. Uh, they have microglial surveillance of, of bad cells, of potential tumor cells. They're involved in neuroplasticity. They normally prune synapses. The problem is when they get overly aggravated or inflamed, they can start pruning synapses excessively in neurodegenerative disease, and they can cause a lot of inflammation. So they can be good, but they can also be bad. And it's important to have the right cell, as you'll see, to study this because you have to really derive them from the yolk sac, unlike other resonant tissue macrophages. Now, it doesn't mean that macrophages don't uh, course into the brain. They do, but the resonant microglia are from the yolk sac, not from hematopoietic stem cells. So like everyone else probably in this room, we've made iPS cells um, using uh, reprogramming factors, non-integrative methods. We make sure our cells are all really pluripotent, and that's where it stops from what other people have done. So then Dorit came to me from a lab uh, in Tel Aviv that had worked extensively on microglia, and she recreated the yolk sac niche, the various growth factors as if you were coming out of the yolk sac. We all came out of the yolk sac, but she knows how to recreate this so it follows normal, real microglial development. And it's, interestingly, a very accelerated differentiation. It only takes 21 days. Many of the, the published uh, protocols that don't have legitimate yolk sac derives to take much longer, three times, even six times longer than this, so just quick. You don't need cell sorting, so it's very convenient and we get a pure and homogeneous population. I'll show you some of those data. So if you just look at kind of standard markers, they, they look like microglia. They have many of the markers of microglia. I'm at a bad angle here, but IBA1, TREM119, many other markers. They function like microglia. That is, they take that phagocytose here, just using zymus and beads, but we've done other criteria for this. So they, they're acting right. They have markers. Now we've done extensive RNA-seq. We're blessed because here on the Torrey Pines Mesa, we have uh, Chris Glass to go to. He was the one who had the science paper last year on human brain microglia and extensive RNA-seq analysis. And we've compared it with Chris. We've had Chris look at ours. And it's very hard. To, I hate when people show these slides because I can't see the data. I'll blow it up in a minute. But you'll see in a moment that um, by RNA-seq transcriptomics data, ours are very close to real human brain microglia. Now, one worry is you get, when you put them in vitro, an in vitro signature, and, and Chris really needs, uh, deserves the credit for looking at this, and ours have a little bit of an in vitro signature, but much less than what other people have seen, and very importantly, no inflammatory markers are turned on, even though we have them in vitro. So this uh, bioinformatics was done in collaboration with Nick Short's lab, well-known bioinformaticist um, uh, here in La Jolla. Okay, now I'm gonna blow up and I think you can see Dorit cells, Dorit sitting in the third row there. And uh, just above that are real primary microglia, and you can see they're very, very close. Now, if you blow this up further, what we find is that there's a particular cluster of 84 genes that are, find, that are found in human brain microglia and in our human-induced pluripotent stem cell microglia. Um, and we believe that this defines a signature for real brain yolk sac-derived microglia, and it has the you know, it has many of the members you'd expect. TREM2 and APOE, which are important in Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases, um, and 82 other genes that we think are very important in really making you a human microglia. 
Okay, so now I'm gonna switch gears and say how we make these microglia. So we, we study both neurodevelopmental, you heard about MEF2C earlier, but we study uh, MEF2C in, in haploinsufficiency. We, dis we discovered it, that it was a form of autism, and we study various uh, neurodegenerative diseases, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Um, because I only have three hours to talk today, I'm gonna only tell you about the Parkinson's data. I'll allude a little bit for the benefit of, of Larry Goldstone, who's been very generous in giving us some of his iPSCs, a little bit about our Alzheimer's data as well. Okay, so June, you were perfect. You told everybody about Parkinson's disease. I see this disease as a neurologist every week. It's the most common movement disorder. He told you about the characteristics of tremor, rigidity, um, et cetera. Now it can also spread. It's thought to spread by alpha-synuclein, one of the misfolded proteins found. You can get Lewy body dementia manifest by cognitive problems, hallucinations, delusions. So it's a bit scary the way it spreads with this protein. And as I mentioned, you have these deposits of alpha-synuclein, known as Lewy bodies, but they can also spread. There's also evidence from a lot of models, even from human brain, that there's inflammation. And that it's not just a, a, a phenomenon that's an epiphenomenon, it seems to also be, uh, in many models, at least causative uh, for the progression of PD and for uh, neuronal injury, both in the substantia nigra and subsequently in the cortex as the disease spreads. And prior work is shown by many labs uh, that there's an inflammatory response to oversynuclein, all the usual characters, as they would say in Casablanca, IL-1 beta, TNF-alpha, nitric oxide, my favorite, Hy uh, hydrogen peroxide, they all seem to be involved. You get a reactive microgliosis that's made much worse by alpha-synuclein. So what we wanted to ask is if the type of alpha-synuclein that's thought to be pathologic, which are these little soluble fibrillar aggregates of alpha-synuclein, could induce specifically um, the inflammasome, a well-studied NLRP3 inflammasome. It's well-studied here at UCSD by uh, Michael Karen, my colleague who participated in these studies. Um, we wanted to know if our human brain microglia would be activated by alpha-synuclein in this regard and what the mechanism was. And so to remind you, the NLRP3 inflammasome um, is triggered in uh, microglia and macrophages uh, by engagement of TLRs, and there's a dual process. There's two signals. There's TLR signaling, and then there's uh, the, the form for us as LPS to do that, endotoxin from bacteria. But then, as Mike Karen and others discovered, there's a second signal needed that injures mitochondria, releases mitochondrial DNA, reactive oxygen species, autophagy doesn't function properly, and this activates this NLRP3 inflammasome, and you end up with active caspase-1, which then cleaves pro-IL-1 beta and pro-IL-18, um, and you get a tremendous cytotoxic cascade with active cytokines thought to contribute to neuronal injury and injury of other cells. And so Michael had done that. Michael and I got together, uh, various drinking parties initially, and then eventually really in the lab. And we said, what about alpha-synuclein and other misfolded proteins, A-beta? And it turns out they can do this. And not only can oligomerized A-beta engage TLRs, I'll talk to you about which one in a moment, it can also provide the second signal. Where it's been known by the work of many people that it can also bind to mitochondria and cause mitochondrial damage. So interestingly, unlike LPS, Oligomerized alpha-synuclein can provide both signals to activate the NLRP3 inflammasome. And I'll show you some of that data right now. As I said, it was done with Michael Karen. Now, in order to do that, we wanted to make sure that we were using alpha-synuclein that everyone agreed was the toxic form. And so people have characterized various oligomers, many papers published on this. There's these little soluble aggregates, aggregates that form fibrils. You can do dynamic light scattering, as shown here, and make sure that you form real oligomers by size. Um, the, the, so the more oligomers, the more white bar there is, and you can see with time, if you let them um, soak overnight, you get more oligomers, and we've verified that by both dy dynamic light scattering and atomic force microscopy with Jeff Kelly's lab at TSRI. You know, TSRI has these amazing chemists. That they think I know some chemistry, so everyone here is sworn to silence. Uh, but they interact with me, and they're really, really amazing chemists. And Jeff is a uh, fantastic protein chemist, you know, developed this new drug for amyloidosis. Uh, Defamidus came out of his lab. And so he's very good at helping us characterize this. So we've taken it a step farther with Gabe Lambder um, at, at TSRI. We've also characterized these by cryo-EM. Others have also done this, and we can see this fibrillar network of, and so we've really well characterized the alpha-synuclein that we're putting onto our IPS-derived 
microglia. I should say we've also done this um, with alpha-synuclein from legitimate human Lewy body dementia brain. We get very concordant results, but I'm going to show you with the synthetic, synthetic alpha-synuclein today. Okay, so now we put on the alpha-synuclein, we get both signals. So what are both signals? To remind you, LPS alone doesn't produce IL-1 beta. You need LPS and the some, some other trigger, ATP, Nagerasin, alum, something else. There, there's a variety of them. So you have, remember, you have to have that mitochondrial damage in addition to TLR engagement. And then you start making IL-1 beta. Now, interestingly, alpha-synuclein monomers doesn't do it, but if you put in oligomers, you get a response. It's less than LPS, but this was a ton of LPS. You still get a substantial response, and you can see it also activates caspase-1 if you do an ELISA in the medium. Just so it's, it seems to be activating the inflammasome. To take that a step further, we know that if we give antibodies to TLR2 but not TLR4, it blocks. So it appears that alpha-synuclein is engaging, in this case, TLR2 receptors on our human brain microglia. And finally, if you knock down with siRNA the NLRP3 inflammasome, you largely abrogate the response. So we know the inflammasome is legitimately involved in this alpha-synuclein response. Okay, so it had been said that alpha-synuclein engages mitochondria, but no one had really looked for pathological evidence of this. So Dorit and her crew did this. We have a variety of evidence for this. So if you look at TMRM, this is a mitochondrial dye sensitive to mitochondrial membrane potential. And you can see the membrane potential falls with A beta oligomers showing that the mitochondria are compromised. Next, we looked at a variety of mitochondrial DNAs, for example, from the electron transport chain, and they're all leaking into the medium if, they're, if the alpha synuclein oligomers are there, meaning that there's mitochondrial damage and actually leak of mitochondrial messages. Another uh, important uh, marker, uh, because it's important in that secondary signal to activate the inflammasome. Um, finally, I mentioned reactive oxygen species, so we have a fluorescent dye, mitosox, that's selective for mitochondrial-produced reactive oxygen species, and lo and behold, not the monomers, but the oligomers generate a lot of that, as shown by more intense fluorescence, quantified here. So we're producing all of these secondary markers out of the mitochondria that we know incites inflammasome activation. Now, I won't show you data for this, but we know that A-beta just makes this worse, and there's recent data. Um, that, you know, we used to think that Alzheimer's disease was A-beta and tau and Lewy body dementia and Parkinson's disease was alpha-synuclein. And like many things, we used to think wrong. It turns out that you're making all these misfolded proteins in all of these diseases just to different degrees. So there's quite a lot of misfolded alpha-synuclein, for example, in Alzheimer's brains, right? And there's many, we actually know one of the mechanisms for this. Uh, we discovered a number of years ago that protein disulfide isomerase, the major chaperone that folds your proteins, gets S nitrosylated by excessive reactive nitrogen species, and you can't fold your proteins properly in any of these diseases, ALS, PD, AD, all of them. So it's not surprising you get a lot of misfolded proteins. And in fact, we found that A beta synergizes with alpha synuclein to just make the inflammasome turn on even more. So it, this is probably what I'm telling you uh, for Parkinson's disease right now is equally applicable in Alzheimer's disease, and we'll get back to that in a minute. Now to just do this a little more, Precisely, I've been talking to you about exogenous alpha-synuclein, and, and although alpha-synuclein spreads in the brain, you might say, so what? So now we want to use endogenously produced alpha-synuclein, and for this, we used an A53T mutant alpha-synuclein IPS cell initially made by my colleague Rudolf Janisch at MIT, and I had published together in Cell a few years ago. And this is a cell line that we used, a very similar protocol to what Jun had just shown you, to make um, IPS-derived dopaminergic A9 neurons. We do a lot of electrophysiology to really prove that there were legitimate A9 neurons, the initial motor uh, neuron, that, the initial, sorry, neuron that's affected in Parkinson's disease. And so now we incubate these A53T iPS-derived neurons with our normal wild-type, right, iPS-derived microglia. And what we can find, we label them up, and you can see that the microglia IBA1 labeled in green, TUG1 to label, we could use TH, they're, they're all TH positive, uh, tyrosine hydroxylase positive for the neurons, and they talk to one another. And in fact, the A53T mutant neurons secrete a large amount of alpha-synuclein shown here, much more than isogenic controls, that's the beauty of this. We have an isogenic wild-type control that doesn't have the point mutation. It's been crispr or other mechanisms to correct it, okay? And what that does is incite the inflammasome in the microglia 
to produce IL-1 beta. And you can measure that in the medium by ELISA. So now the neurons, alpha synuclein, is talking to hemoglobins, and this is endogenous alpha synuclein from the neurons, okay? So, as you might expect, if you now immunodeplete the alpha synuclein using a variety of immunosynuclein antibodies, tethered to beads, spin it out, the alpha synuclein is gone. We know the alpha synuclein is gone because we measure it. You can get it out of the medium, and you apply those medium to microglia, to our I HIMG is the uh, abbreviation for human induced pluripotent microglia. You can see that we eliminate the inflammasome response, no more IL-1 beta released into the medium. But remember, because we're going to come back to this, this is an immunodepletion. The antibody is on beads, you spin it out. The antibody is no longer there. Please remember that. I'll come back to it. Okay, so now you could say, well, all of this is in a dish. So we did it in a brain. With my colleague, uh, Richard Ransohoff, who's a real microglial expert, much more than I'll ever be, he said, you need to use a special mouse humanized mouse that's going to support your human microglia. Dorit spent so long making the microglia. Now let's not kill them in the mouse. Um, so we have a mouse with the, that's expressing these various factors. We uh, trans, uh, in, sort of inject in or, or transplant in the microglia. They spread. They migrate. You can see the microglia. Uh, human antigen shown in red, microglia in green. Um, you know, this is not a great merged image, but all those green, so some of the green, are the endogenous mouse, right? But all the red are the transplanted human microglia, okay? So there's a lot of them there. If you now look at the contiguous neurons and what's happening, I have to tell you we, we transplant a variety of different induced microglial cells. So they are first primed with oligomerized alpha-synuclein to activate the inflammasome or they're just exposed to vehicle, okay? So we're injecting two kinds of microglia, got it? And so what we do is look at the neurons, and if you inject regular microglia, a few neurons die, as shown here by cleave caspase 3, so they undergo apoptosis. Your neuron in red, your cleave caspase green, red and green is yellow, so a few yellow, but if you've primed, exposed the microglia, to alpha-synuclein, to activate the inflammasome, which I showed you was activated, you start killing all the contiguous neurons. Certainly don't want that in your brain, but that's probably what's going on. Okay. And here's a quantification of that. You can see that the alpha-synuclein primed microglia really kill a lot of neurons measuring caspase 3. Okay. So now the next work was not only done by our lab, but a variety of labs over several years. And what they did is put alpha-synuclein antibody complex, so now you just add antibody, uh, for example, to the mouse that's expressing alpha-synuclein. And many people have done this. We did it in vitro, and indeed we showed that the inflammasome is activated in mouse microglia. Other people have done this in vivo, right? That's the basis of what we're gonna talk about in a series of clinical trials, that you can abrogate the responses by putting in antibody to alpha-synuclein. But if you're in a mouse, you're using mouse microglia. And then they leapt to human clinical trials. So based on this, they did, uh, based on the in vivo alpha-synuclein mouse transgenic data, uh, there's now a phase three trial for humanized antibodies against alpha-synuclein. As you know, there's very similar data in Alzheimer's disease with anti-A beta antibodies, a variety of them. Um, although nine of those trials have failed, there's still the Biogen SI trial out there. Hopefully, you know, I'm hoping that my patients are benefited from it. Uh, but I'm going to show you I th at least one reason why I think these trials are doomed to failure. That is, they're based on models with mouse microglia. So we repeated that experiment. Now, we're not immunodepleting. We're just adding antibody to alpha-synuclein to human microglia. Okay? And what we find is that the, the inflammasome is super activated in the presence. And we've done this with a whole host of different antibodies. Mouse, rabbit, human. In fact, one human humanized antibody very similar to that being used in the Roche phase three trial. Shown here, it doesn't have an FC receptor to bind, so it's clearly the FAB fragment that's engaged and you superactivate the inflammasome. And it's not the antibody. Antibody alone does not activate um, 
the inflammasome any more than any immunoglobulin. So it appears if you're a human microglia, you don't do well in the presence of antibody, even human antibody to alpha-synuclein. Now remember, if you immunodeplete, we knew it was um, alpha-synuclein. Unfortunately, I can't immunodeplete the brain once I've given you antibody. You know, I, re I remember as a kid seeing the astronauts rolling around in centrifuges to simulate uh, anti-gravity, but you know, you, we don't, can't do that to our patients with Parkinson's disease. So you have the antibody there, and we think you're gonna make things worse. Okay, so what I've told you then is that alpha-synuclein is made by the neurons, it engages TLR2 receptors. I blow that up over here. And that activates the inflammasome. It provides both the primary trigger TLR and the mitochondrial injury trigger. Pro-IL-1 beta is cleaved to IL-1 beta and also IL-18, and you secrete these cytokines. Antibody just super activates that pathway in the human context, but interestingly, not in the mouse context. And I don't know why. We're trying to discover that, but I don't know why that is. But not all, you know, although a lot of people act like rodents, their microglia don't. The human microglia seem different. And so there's a lot of IL-1 beta and IL-18 released, and instead of protecting the neurons, we're actually injuring them. So this in part may be one of the reasons, there may be many, but it may be one of the reasons um, why human antibody trials are not done so far very well. So in conclusion, we have, Dorit and team have produced this accelerated protocol to make an homogenous population of functional microglial cells that by RNA-seq really, really seem like the right cell. Uh, their global gene expression pattern overlaps largely with legitimate human brain microglia, as Chris Glass and his um, group have looked at. Alpha-synuclein oligomers can provide both signals for activation of the NLRP3 inflammasome, and this may contribute well to uh, Parkinson's disease, inflammation, and probably also Alzheimer's and the work I've alluded to. IPS-derived microglia can be co-cultured with neurons, and these neurons can secrete alpha-synuclein to incite them. And unlike, maybe most importantly, unlike the mouse microglia, the human microglia, stimulated with misfolded oligomers of alpha-synuclein and antibodies, seem to hyperactivate the NLRP3 inflammasome, which could, in theory, make the disease worse rather than, than improving it. So we do this in this beautiful new building. You're all invited. It's right opposite the Torrey Pines Golf Course driving range. Uh, to my, um, you know, I can't say I'm real happy about this, but every once in a while I found a golf ball next to my Tesla in the parking lot. So we're really close <laughs> to the driving range. Um, and we welcome visitors. Um, it's, a, it's the big drug discovery uh, facility over there. We do a lot of stem cells for drug discovery as well. And I just want to thank, I, a lot of these people are in the audience and I couldn't do any of the IPS work without them. And also these other labs that I mentioned um, throughout the talk um, here in the La Jolla area have been tremendous. And I want to acknowledge funding from NIH has been very good to me. I appreciate Sir Maria and everyone else who's uh, given us money. And I'm glad to answer any questions. Thanks so much for listening. there's strategies there because there's obviously some in the clinic so I'm just curious your yeah. thoughts there. Um, potentially they have to get into the brain right but potentially we're actually doing that experiment but we can inject them in, you know in, in mice but we're actually doing that experiment right now in mice with human microglia injected yeah but that's a thought. No, so we've done it with, uh, how many different species have we used? Um, four? Yeah, including mouse. We, you know, that's what we thought initially, Larry, and unfortunately it's not true. Um, yeah. Our last question. When you added the activated microglia and they killed the neurons, do you know what uh, the factors or how that neuronal cell death is induced? Is it just IL-1 beta or is there more to it or something different? So yeah, so the way to test that is with IL-1 antagonists, receptor antagonists, we're doing that, and also we're verifying that TLR2 antagonists can block it. So that work is, is underway now. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.